Good afternoon, and welcome to Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Thanks for joining us today. Likeable Science is all about how science is a vital and interesting part of everyone's life, scientist or not, and how we should all embrace and enjoy science. To help me explore that today, I have with me uh, via phone uh, Dr. Marco Rolandi, uh, the co-founder of a group called Cruise Foam. Welcome, Marco. Hi, Ethan. How are you doing? I'm Glad good. to be on the show. Well, th thanks for taking the time to join me. I know, I know Marco's a busy guy. He's a head of the uh, electrical engineering department at UC Santa Cruz. I knew him back at, in Seattle, <clears throat> the University of Washington there, when we were both there. But uh, he's also started a, this group called Cruise Foam. So may maybe just uh, start us out. Marco, tell us a little bit about, about what Cruise Foam is. Yeah, so Cruise Foam is a startup company. Uh, we spun out at UC Santa Cruz two years ago. Uh, I co-founded Cruise Foam with uh, John Feltz, the CEO, and Jean-Lin Zhang, uh, the CTO. And what Cruise Foam does, it makes a compostable, expanded polystyrene out of seafood waste. And our mission is to help end the plastic pollution, especially the plastics that end up in the ocean. Oh, I see. So that's, that's a very, very admirable mission. You, you take, essentially, shrimp shells and that kind of stuff and process it so it's not rotting away and smelling and turning it into, into a packing material that you can then use to uh, in shipping materials back and forth and, and all that? that? That's exactly right. Uh, what Cruise Foam does takes a, a polysaccharide, a sugar, from uh, shrimp shells. This uh, polysaccharide is called chitin. It's actually the second most abundant polysaccharide after cellulose. And it does have many properties in common with cellulose. Cellulose what they used to make paper that comes from trees. And uh, we actually purchase chitin as a commodity and we transform it into a packaging foam that has the same properties as expanded polystyrene, but is sustainable, is uh, biosourced, and is uh, compostable. And the nice thing about it is that chitin actually is used to fixate nitrogen in the soil, so when it composts, it actually can be used as a fertilizer. Wow, so that's got a lot, a lot of advantages then, uh, <clears throat> particularly advantages over the, the plastics that we normally use, the, the fossil fuel-based uh, packing materials. So, um, that's right. Where, so where did, this, where did this interesting idea arise? How did, how did you come up with it? Well, that's a, that's, a, that's a bit of a long story, but I've been working with chitin for about a decade now. And uh, chitin is used as a biomaterial for implantable devices, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, among other things, we were looking actually is using chitin for closing wounds because it has hemostatic properties. What that means, it helps to stop blood flow. Um, I'm, I, my research at the university involves making very small things, and so micro and nanofabrication. But, and, and after a while, we realized it was actually very difficult to make very small things with chitin. And so when we started, started talking with my one of my co-founders, John Feltz, we, we decided to make something big like a foam. And the, at the beginning, actually, our, our motivation was that we wanted to make surfboards. Um, and I'm sure this will resonate as well as much with your audience as it resonates with the, with the people here in Santa Cruz. Absolutely. Uh, the idea was that surfboards are actually made by basically expanded polystyrene or polyurethane, which are petroleum-based foam wrapped in fiberglass. And what struck us, and both John and myself, our surface was that, you know, when a surfboard is broken, it ends up in the ocean. And, you know, surfers love the ocean. And we didn't want to, like, our, the, the sort of, like, the, the sports that we do to actually contribute further to plastic pollution in the ocean. And that's why we thought, hey, I think we should make foam to make surfboards out of uh, shrimp shells out of chitin. Mm -hmm. Now, we're still considering making surfboards, but we realized that even if we were to substitute every surfboard on the planet with our material, we still wouldn't tackle the problem at the core, which is this sort of like plastics floating around the ocean, many of which come from packaging. And that's why we shifted our attention to the bigger problem, which is expanded polystyrene and these non-biodegradable plastics they're using what's called secondary packaging. Especially with the increase in e-commerce these days, all of these materials are just going to grow in more, more and more in volume and contribute, among other things, to the great Pacific garbage patch, which separates us, unfortunately. You know, we should just be separated 
by ocean and fish, and instead we have plastics between California and Hawaii. <laughs> that is dreadful. Right, you know? right. It's 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 a it's a huge problem. I know. I had a guest on uh, a few weeks ago who was talking about the issue, and pointed out that there are estimates now that. By about 2050, there's going to be, by weight, more plastic in the sea than fish, which is sort, sort of right. frightening That's to think right. about. Um, that means there's a huge amount of plastic, and a lot of it, as you say, comes from just odd little sources like, yeah, like packaging material, which, because, yes, because we're now buying everything online and it's being shipped to us, there's more and more packaging material being used. So this is, this, that, that's very interesting that you, uh, that you, you, you sort of found a, an interesting niche. So, um, you say you buy chitin, so somebody's already collecting sort of shrimp shells and everything and, and you know, producing chitin, or do you have to process the, the, the shrimp shells yourself or some facility? Yeah, we, we purchase the chitin. We don't process the shrimp shells ourselves. Okay. It's something that it's, it's, uh, it's already on the market, okay. and there's a fair amount of production. And uh, a lot of the production happens close by packaging, plants where they usually package frozen seafood and then they have uh, readily available uh, shrimp shell waste uh, for producing chitin mm -hmm. and uh, they, we just purchase them, purchase chitin bulk as a commodity mm -hmm. and, uh, and then we transform it into our cruise form. Oh, interesting, interesting. I, I'd never of course heard of chitin in terms of a, a, a product, I had heard of it in terms of yes, insect exoskeletons mainly. But uh, so it must have other uses too. If somebody is bothered already to set up uh, processing plants to, to uh, re recycle out of uh, seafood waste, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's it's very interesting. And, and chitin is currently used um, as a fertilizer for agricultural uses. That would be the lowest kind of value use, but it's also used as a food supplement and biomedical uses, the ones that it's purified a lot. And the cruise form actually can use the sort of like the least viable chitin, the one that is not very pure to make packaging, because obviously we need a much lower level of purity for packaging than we need for say a food supplement or biomedical use. Sure. So without without going into too much technical detail or revealing any of your uh, patentable secrets, what what do you do to turn this chitin into uh, into this packaging material? The chitin, chitin comes in what form? Is it, I suspect our viewers wouldn't know that. So, so chitin comes to us in a, in a, in a vat in vats, and these vats are full with the powdery substance that looks a lot like flour, or uh, or like flakes, depends on the material that we purchase. Okay. And uh, then we have a proprietary water-based process that lets us uh, turn this into a slurry, and, that's, and then this slurry, is, is, uh, we, we let it expand into and dry out into a foam. Oh, that, that, sounds, that sounds great. I mean, in fact, that you, it sounds like a relatively straightforward and hopefully not too energy intensive process, right? Yeah, it's it's relatively straightforward. It's not energy intensive. It's simple, and we we are actually in the process of scaling up, and we are we are looking at ways to scale it that involve uh, actually the same components of manufacture that are currently used for expanders polystyrene, and borrowing borrowing a little bit of uh, knowledge and some machinery from pulp and paper. Uh, so then we can streamline the process, make it quick, make it scalable, make it inexpensive for widespread adoption, and also make it not energy intensive because, of course, otherwise, it will, if the material will use up more petroleum to produce, then, you know, petroleum is materials that will also be a problem. Right, right. I mean, it's a, it's a classic issue with the water bottles, that they actually use more water in making the water bottle than the water bottle holds, right? And, right, right, right. Exactly, <laughs> one, exactly. one reason we should be avoiding that use. Um, I see. So, so this is great. This is, sounds very exciting then. Um, and, and so you've just been really getting this going in the last couple of years, right? You said you, said you started this maybe you started this process about two years ago? Yeah, that, that's about right. Uh, John Feltz was a PhD student in electrical engineering here at UC Santa Cruz. And Jolie Zhang was actually a, P a PhD student at University of Washington. They both were working with me. Uh, John and I developed the technology for cruise form at UC Santa Cruz. So the original intellectual property is actually owned by the university and cruise form as an exclusive license. And then uh, about, uh, about two years ago, we realized that 
was ready to get spun out of the university uh, to start a company, and John decided to take a leave of absence from his studies and uh, did a few of these like startup competitions, and then we joined the National Science Foundation I Corps for uh, for uh, customer discovery to figure out whether where the product market fit. And uh, in uh, June, Jolene Zhang graduated with her PhD and joined the company uh, as a CTO. And so it's in Jolene as her, done her PhD on hiking processing, not foam, other type of processing, but she has very strong expertise in the material. Oh, that's, uh, that's great. And you, you've it's sort of been a, a, a business out, sort of out of your lab and out of, very much out of your research group. That's, that's, that's wonderful. That's a very yes, that's sort of unusual. I don't think many many lab groups have done that kind of thing. Um, I think I think it's more common these days, and and uh, I think it's important because uh, it's important that whatever research we do is gonna can have a direct impact on society, right? And for us, really, it's about impact because. Cruise Foam, of course, wants to be profitable because we're a company, we're a corporation, actually. Um, but well, ultimately, our mission is to really end plastic pollution. So if we can have a positive impact on society while also making a sustainable and profitable business, that would be wonderful for us. Yeah, yeah. That, no, that, that sounds like a really, a, a, what, what they talk about, the triple bottom line, right? That, that you're, you're looking for... Uh, something that's doing doing good for yourselves, doing good for the, the earth around it, and, and filling a human need, right? Uh, that's, a good, that's right. Yeah, that's 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 in, incredible. So um, you, you said this uh, cruise foam is is biodegradable. So when you uh, at some point after it's gone through perhaps several cycles of packaging, somebody just can take and sort of throw it away and put it in in their garden, or what? what what's the deal with that? Yeah, that's right. And I would say, um, so we, we are looking, there, there are actually certifications, there are many ASTM standards that need to be met in order to be compostable, either what's called industrially compostable or um, sort of like backyard compostable. Well, we, we are in the process of obtaining these certifications because they actually take time. Uh, but what we've done already on our side, we've actually we have actually tested the cruise foam in our in, our, in my backyard compost, mm -hmm. and after a little over two months, the material has disappeared. And I actually have some pictures that I haven't had a chance to sh share with you, unfortunately, of the foam after a few weeks with uh, with um, worms eating it. Mm -hmm. And so you can it's really because basically it's just it is a little it's basically like throwing shrimp shells in your compost, mm -hmm. and so it just you just have a, you know. A worms can grow in it, eat it, and process it, and then it just becomes part of the organic compost that one can use to fertilize the garden. And that's what I use it for right now. Yeah, no, that, that, that's great. But I assume it can go for several different uses. I, I know I typically will take that kind of packaging and get something in a package, and when I'm sending something back out, I'll use that packaging again and go through several cycles, right? So right now, we are focusing on what I guess you would call single-use plastics. That's our tar first target market. Okay. For example, if you receive an you know, a, a TV, let's say, with corners made of expanded polystyrene, those corners, you will dispose of them after the use for right. packaging. And that is our target use right now. We, f we, we feel that like because it's compostable, that's our biggest uh, value proposition. We've not looked at reusability of the foam as much yet. Okay. But it's certainly something on our radar as well. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I can see that might be, uh, that, that might be a, a thing to look at in the future. Um, I tell you what, I think we're going to have to drop off to a quick break here. Uh, I'm talking to Dr. Marco Rolandi, the co-founder of Cruise Foam uh, out of uh, California here, and uh, this uh, wonderful biodegradable uh, uh, packaging material. And we'll be back in about one minute. Uh, until then, I'm your host, Ethan Allen, and join us when we come back. Aloha and mabuhay. My name is Emmy Ortega Anderson, inviting you to join us every Tuesday here on Pinoy Power Hawaii with Think Tech Hawaii. We come to your home at 12 noon every Tuesday. We invite you to uh, listen, watch uh, for our mission of empowerment. We aim to enrich, enlighten, educate, entertain, and we hope to empower. 
Again, maraming salamat po, mabuhay, and aloha. <laughs> Aloha, I'm Gwen Harris, the host here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of the supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks so much. Good afternoon and welcome back to Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Thanks for coming back and joining us for the second half of Likeable Science today. Uh, I have with me on the phone, Dr. Marco Rolandi, the co-founder of Cruise Phone. Welcome back, Marco. Hi, Ethan. How you doing? <laughs> doing, doing good, doing good. So uh, the first half, Marco was explaining to us about what Cruise Phone is, how it's made from shrimp shells. It's, it's this wonderful uh, biodegradable, uh, packing material that, that has a lot of the same properties as polystyrene or polyurethane structural foams, but is uh, made not from uh, fossil fuels, but rather from, uh, essentially it's a waste product from uh, shellfish. And uh, talked about how, how he got the, the ideas going in, in his lab and brought some of his, his lab folks on in, <clears throat> and, and they're, they're making a, a nice go of this in, in a good company. So, um, you know, I mean, plastics get used for a lot of different things, and the polystyrene that they use for packing has to have certain kinds of mechanical properties, right? It has to be a bit compressible, but not too compressible. Uh, uh, yeah, Ethan. So I guess there's actually very many kinds of poly expanded polystyrene for different uses. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's like there's up there's like polystyrene two, four, fifteen, nine. Uh, the the polystyrene that we try to match is the polystyrene used for packaging typically, and uh, our our material has uh, has the same compression strength, which is basically like how much can you squish the material by until if it, it, it breaks, right? Which kind of is, is an indication of how good of a packaging material it is. Right. As uh, the expanded polystyrene used for packaging. And we also, and we can tune the, the mechanical properties of the material by changing the, the, the formula. And one of the things we can tune is how cushiony it is. In that like for certain packaging application, we need the material that is a little bit uh, firmer, if you will. For other packaging, you might need the material that sort of feels a little bit more like a cushion. And so we can, we can tune that to, to adapt to different applications. Oh, that, that's very interesting, and of course, it makes it much more valuable if you if you can make it uh, variable like that and, and change its properties a bit without too much trouble. It that gives you, I would expect, more sort of more markets for it, more different uses for it, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So hey, <clears throat> one of these days you'll be putting it in surfboards again, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's our dream. We still, I think we're still, we're still gonna, eventually we, we're gonna do that, but for now, you know, you wanna, we wanna make sure that next time we do, go surfing, we don't find any spent, any polystyrene packaging material floating around our boards. Yeah, yeah. And so we, we wanna tackle that problem first. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, what happens, uh, since you say it's comp compostable, what happens if stuff gets wet, you know, package is being sent and it gets left out and, you know, gets some rain on it? Does your stuff hold up? So we we we're looking at uh, at sort of like what you would call water resistance, mm -hmm. um, but right now it's 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 pretty good. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess we haven't left uh, left in the rain yet, and we're gonna have to wait some time here because summer is just uh, you know <laughs> it's spring in California, so it's gonna be a while before it rains. But mm -hmm. uh, the the material is actually very very good uh, properties when it comes to water resistance. Mm -hmm. uh, as it's, as we said, because we st the original recipe we started developing trying to make. Surfboard, so we always had water resistance in mind, uh, and so we, we are we're definitely are, are are sort of sensitive to that, and it's something that we, we can do well. Huh. Well, that, that, that's great. So if it if it is water resistant like that, and the properties can be adjusted, it would seem there must be uh, essentially almost then a number of different sort of applications for it potentially, right? Oh uh, yeah, I mean, as I said, what is this? Is something that we we keep in mind. Uh, it, it depends on right now. Our first target application is is what's called protective packaging. Mm -hmm. um, 
and and where you know we we have questions for example whether we could make uh, plastic cups with it and it's something that we're also looking at uh, it might come down the line and a little bit further down the line for for many reasons uh, but but uh, it's not nothing is out of the question right now and it just it just uh, you know we're a small startup and so we need to focus our efforts technical as both as commercial in a few target areas first and then we're going to move towards the other application we can reach yeah absolutely absolutely it's critical as you start up a business that you keep it all focused on a, on a a predictor niche and get that up and going well. So and that's an interesting, that brings up an interesting point. How, how are you approaching companies who buy packaging materials or use packaging materials? How are you sort of selling this stuff to them? Because I'm sure they basically are, uh, like, like all big companies, they want to do things the way they've always done them because they, that's a known, trusted process. So, I mean, we, we are at this stage where we, we're developing a scale-up process. Mm -hmm. um, what I can say is that there's a lot of interest from, from the industry because this, this you know, the plastics is a problem for everybody. And, uh, and also there is, a, the, from the regulatory perspective, there's many new laws coming out where uh, the, the use of what's called, what are called single-use plastics are, are regulated much more. For example, Europe is gonna ban every single-use plastics by 2021, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. So at the, at the corporate level, there is very much interest in, in working with us. And uh, among other things, uh, in the past, in the past few months, we were part of what's called sustainable packaging and materials cohort, the plug and play accelerator. And they actually connected with us with many companies that are interested in working with Cruise Foam for their packaging needs. Oh, that, that's great. Yeah, no, it seems very, very timely then because, yeah, I know there is there's a huge movement these days to ban single use plastics. Uh, Hawaii recently has banned plastic drinking straws. Uh, uh -huh. There's a, a constant battle here going on on Oahu right now about getting rid of styrofoam containers and making those illegal. Uh, more and more grocery, or grocery stores and various other kinds of stores are, of course, stopping distributing plastic bags of any sort. So, um, yeah, it, uh, the interesting timing that you, that you found uh, when this, this issue is reaching into sort of broad public awareness and plastics are sort of getting a, almost a, a bad name in a way, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I think like plastics are are amazing for many things. Oh yeah. But, but for other, you know, plastics last for a very long time. So those applications where they need to last for a very long time, I think for a while it's going to be difficult to to find substitutes. But other applications where they're they're single use, I believe whether it's cruise foam or other materials can come in and, and uh, really uh, make the entire ecosystem more sustainable and, you know, get rid of all the plastics that ends up in the ocean or in the landfills. Yeah, I mean, that, that's interesting that you say there's a whole, uh, uh, what we call a hui here in Hawaii, a whole group of, of companies all focused around that issue of reusable, uh, sustainable plas uh, packaging materials. You know, that's, that's good to hear. Again, I, I'm often appalled at you get a product and yeah, it's, it comes in a plastic container and within that there's cardboard and within that there's still more plastic and, and you know, it seems sometimes it's quite a bit of overkill in the, in the packaging. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, there's a, we, we, you know, we, we package everything with a lot of things. We have a lot of stuff, material, and so we want to make sure that the material we use is sustainable and ideally compostable or and it's not going to like ruin the environment. Right, right, because so many of those packages, there, there isn't anything to do with them once you've used it once. You know, it, it is basically, as you say, it's, it's a throwaway uh, idea, and, and we're, we do have a society where that's pretty much been our go-to mode. You just use something once and toss it away. So you're developing, you're, you're sort of working with people rather than trying to change their behavior exactly and get them to reuse things, giving them something they can use once and throw away, and it's not doing any harm. Indeed, from what you said, it's serving as actually a fertilizer and can actually help help their compost, help their lawn, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm testing out to my tomatoes right now, and uh, I'll call you back in a few months and let you know whether they're better than last year. <laughs> That's great. No, it is. As long as I don't taste shrimpy, right? <laughs> that would be too weird. Um, so... Where do you see this going? I mean, what, what, do, you, what do you, if, if looking down in a sort of an ideal world, looking down five years, ten years down the road, where, where do you see cruise foam going, being? Well, 
I mean, I can tell you where I hope it's going to go. <laughs> uh, obviously, our dream is to substitute every, you know, substitute every piece of uh, expanded polystyrene packaging with our material. Um, that's what I think we can do. Uh, cool. And uh, I guess time, time will tell whether we're going to be able to do it. But the, as you said, the, the market seems to be ripe. There is customer demand and uh, our material performs well. And of course, you know, we started a company, so we, we have to dream big. Yeah. And our dreams are, are big, and I hope they can really make, you know, hurt the better place than it already is, because the less plastics is in the ocean, the better. Yeah, I mean, this, this is actually, you know, a real sort of interesting story, because when I knew you back at University of Washington, you weren't working, on, I mean, you may, may have been working on chitin, but you weren't, you weren't sort of thinking along these lines, right? You weren't you weren't talking about making packaging material at that point at all, particularly. So it seems like, you know, it's a very interesting illustrative study of, or case study of how, you know, a science research can find new applications, find new directions, sort of. No, that that, that is true. I mean, I think I think like often enough, you know, what what just sort of like the opportunities like one wants to be ready for the opportunities that come about. And and uh, if if you know when in science science is knowledge right, right. and uh, knowledge lets you understand those opportunities or makes you ready for the opportunity when they present themselves. That's really what was the sort of the power of science and knowledge is that if you understand things well, then you can find a way to use them to solve big problems. And sometimes these problems can be in very desperate fields like packaging or biomedical engineering, for example. Right, right. That's yeah. That's that's a, that's a great a great uh, sort of takeaway message right here. Is you, you you had this stuff that was, you were working on for biomedicine, rather high tech, uh, fancy sounding uh, enterprise, and here you found this great use for it in a, in a very sort of it seems like a pretty mundane thing. This is packaging, but it's potentially doing tremendous good to the planet. It really uh, you know can, as you say, ultimately replace all the styrofoam, all the polystyrene foams that are being used for to wrap and protect and, and shelter so many of our things. Hey, this, is, this has been just really wonderful to, to talk to you. I've, I've learned a lot, uh, and I'm sure our audience has too. Um, so I, I thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to me here. And uh, it's, it's been a, a wonderful, uh, truly likable science experience that you've, that you've given us here. Thank you so much, Marco. Thank you, Ethan. Great chatting with you again. All right. You take care. Okay, bye-bye. And I hope you, our audience, will come back and uh, see us next week here on Likeable Science, here on ThinkTech Hawaii. Until then.